Tonight, two Canadian sports teams make history on the world stage. A World Cup goal before a crushing defeat. Oh, I'm proud, proud of what they achieved tonight. As another Team Canada celebrates a championship win. An unprecedented display of defiance in China. Outrage amidst strict COVID lockdowns and calls for the president's resignation. And Bilal Beg, the star of the award-winning show, sort of, on a new season and a powerful message. If we do this well, this can mean a lot for a lot of people. This is The National with Ian Hennemanzi. Canada's dreams of winning a men's World Cup match will have to wait a little longer. The team lost today, but not before making history on the pitch. Canadians across the country watch star player Alfonso Davies do what no Canadian has done before. He scored Canada's first ever goal in the men's tournament just seconds into the match. That glory, though, was short-lived. Croatia battling back to win. That means Canada won't advance past the first round. But with the pain, there is also pride. Thomas Dagla begins our coverage tonight from Doha. With a swing in their step, and splashes of Canadian red everywhere, fans arrived energized, if not a bit stressed. We all believe in them right now, and we're nervous excitement. Before a do or die game against Croatia. We'll take the cup home, are we? The trip was decades in the making for friends and family of team captain Atiba Hutchinson, 40 in all traveled from Brampton, Ontario. It's very exciting to see him play with Canada. Hutchinson making his record 100th appearance for the national team in such a meaningful match. The whole country behind the team and what we like to see now is just, we want to see the ball go in the back of the net. And they didn't have to wait long. Alfonso Davies with a header scored Canada's first ever goal at the Men's World Cup after just 67 seconds. A match that began with so much promise for Canada turned ugly fast as Croatia's Andre Kramaric got the ball past Canadian keeper Milan Borjan. And within minutes, the Croatians scored again. Canada tried to regroup in the second half but faced more pressure from Croatia. Kramaric broke Canada's spirit with his second goal. Croatia would go on to win 4-1. Oh, I'm proud, proud of uh, what, they, what they achieved tonight was to make some history for our country. Disappointed, and they'll be disappointed tomorrow. They'll be, they'll be hurting. Canadians left the stadium dejected, knowing their team's hopes of reaching the second round were over. Uh, they could have played with a lot more energy, to be honest. And amid it all, some found reason for hope, like hosting the Men's World Cup at home next time. I ask everybody to wait for us in 2026. We still believe on our team, Canada forever. <laughs> Thomas Canada's coach John Herdman made a comment a few days ago that some thought would motivate the Croatians, and maybe it did. Yeah, Andre Kramaric, the Croatian forward who scored those two goals today, ironically thanked John Herdman for the motivation. This is a story, Ian, that goes back a few days now to when Herdman made comments using salty language to describe uh, the way the Canadian team would handle the Croatians. Uh, it became tabloid fodder in Croatia. And now Kramaric is saying it is the Croatians who got the last laugh. I should mention Herdman didn't make any such comments tonight about uh, Canada's final opponents, Morocco. They will face Morocco on Thursday. Win, lose or draw after that match, the Canadians are going home. Ian. Thank you, Thomas. And with Canada's elimination, the big question for many becomes who to cheer for now? Here's Susanna De Silva on how Canadians felt today and who they want to see win. Canadians were ready to face Croatia. We're extremely excited after the way they'd played against uh, Belgium. I didn't get off to work till like 4 or 5 a.m. and I went home, slept a couple hours, and now we're here. Excitement turned into delirium after a dream start. Any 
mean, that that first goal was that beats anything, regardless of the result. Yeah. Now we feels like we've won already. Scored first goal ever at a World Cup, actually. That is a, is a W in my books. A healthy mind frame to be in, given what came next. And no amount of fretting or cheering could will more goals for Canada. Today wasn't the day, but I can say after 35 or 34 years, we make it to the World Cup, and that's what I feel proud about it. Didn't go the way we wanted it to go, but we showed hard. We played with passion. I love this team. We got to get a win against Morocco just, just for the hell of it. For many Canadians, having Canada to cheer for was a happy bonus. Now it's back to focusing on the teams they typically cheer for. In Vancouver, that was already on display at the Croatian Cultural Center. We're going to have to pick one or the other, and just Croatia is the one we're going to pick. Why? It's, it's just where we're from. Yeah. It's, you know, it's who we are. Whoever scored was the jersey that I'd wear. So I started with my Croatia jersey, Canada scored, wore my Canada jersey, and then back. Elsewhere across Canada, allegiances also shifted. Argentina, all the way. Now I'm going to see Messi lift that cup. Brazil. Brazil. <laughs> but hold on to those Canada jerseys. Many are already looking ahead four years to when Canada will co-host alongside the United States and Mexico. Seeing these children who are now can dream, not just playing soccer, they can dream of being in the World Cup in 2026. It's, it's a huge for soccer community, it's huge for this country. A hopeful future after a disappointing day. Susanna Da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. A huge win and a big celebration for Canadian tennis. This was a scene after Canada captured the Davis Cup for the very first time. We often think of tennis as an individual sport, but as Lisa Shing explains, this was definitely a team win. Canada are the 2022 Davis Cup World Champions. A historic win for Canada in the tournament known as the World Championship of Tennis. 22-year-old Montrealer Felix Auger Aliassime sealed the deal for Canada after beating his opponent from Australia, a country that has won the Davis Cup 28 times. This is the first time Canada has claimed it. My legs just collapsed and then to have like Frank and everybody rush me and uh, screaming like uh, it was it was amazing. Canada has reached the final just once before in 2019, where Auger Aliassime and Denis Shapovalov were defeated by Spain. This time, the two were instrumental in delivering the victory. You play many matches throughout the years, but um, days like today, you remember for a long time. In recent years, Canadian tennis has turned out some powerhouse stars, and many of them have had individual moments on the international stage. Now, what's different about the Davis Cup is that it brings some of those stars together, playing as a national team. What we've proven is we're not just individuals, that Team Canada, Tennis Canada, has put to together a bunch of athletes that are cohesive, that work well together. Playing for your country and, and also your teammates. So every match when you you know you're on the court, just, there's so much more on the line. It just feels so much um, more important. This Toronto tennis club is seeing growing interest in the sport. I never thought they would have won it. What do you think this means for Canada? Um, something big in the future of tennis. To keep moving forward, never give up in a and always play till the end. There is something special happening here. The sports governing body in Canada hopes this is a moment young people will remember. I think a lot of young players or even uh, kids who maybe haven't yet started playing tennis will want to pick up a racket and, uh, and try this wonderful sport. Especially if Canada keeps up this momentum. Lisa Shang, CBC News, Toronto. Let's turn now to Canada's new strategy for Beijing. The federal government unveiled how it will deal with what it calls an increasingly disruptive China. David Thurton takes us through it and what some say is missing. Liberal cabinet ministers are talking tough about a world superpower. China is an increasingly disruptive global power. And Canadians expect us to have an ambitious, cleared eye comprehensive plan and that's exactly what our government is doing. That plan is the federal government's new Indo-Pacific strategy. It earmarks more than $2.2 billion to forge closer ties with other countries in the region, a half billion of that to improve military and intelligence cooperation. 
we will challenge China when we need to, and we will cooperate with China when we must. The strategy comes as China behaves aggressively, cracking down on protests in Hong Kong and threatening Taiwan's autonomy. Also at a time when Canada's relationship with China is complicated. After the detention and release of two Canadians, retaliation widely believed for the prosecution of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver. Some say the plan doesn't do enough to protect diaspora communities in Canada or address allegations China interfered in a Canadian election. I don't think you can go out or he, the government should lead us out into the Indo-Pacific region until it's dealt with a real threat to our autonomy, to our sovereignty. Ministers sidestep questions about potential retaliation from China, even though Canada's approach lines up with our allies. That being said, we're a little easier to attack than the U.S., for instance. So I would expect the government of China to, um, you know, say some words that we don't like. Something seen when President Xi Jinping confronted the Prime Minister on the sidelines of the G20, after the Prime Minister's office shared details of a meeting between the two. If there is sincerity we in your part, free and open and frank dialogue, and that is what we will continue to have. Earlier this month, China's embassy in Canada called preliminary details of this strategy detrimental to peace and security in the region. It went on to say that Canada was going down the wrong path. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Inside China, President Xi Jinping is facing an unprecedented wave of public dissent. Protesters in the street are calling for him to resign over the country's harsh zero COVID policy. As Katie Simpson shows us, their anger has been building, but one incident in particular appears to have been a tipping point. Xi Jinping! Stop her! Xi Jinping! Stop her! The oh, acts goodness. of defiance are growing bolder Stop and spreading to more cities. Protesters shout, step down, Xi Jinping. His zero COVID strategy has pushed them past a breaking point. It triggers a predictable response, part of the reason why dissent is so rare in China. How many people have been arrested so far and what's happened to the detained remains unclear. What is certain? There will be consequences for those caught speaking out against President Xi. Because President Xi uh, tied himself to the zero COVID policy. So when people are protesting against excessiveness of the policy, uh, it becomes more likely to challenge directly uh, the leadership. China's zero COVID strategy has kept case counts low, but it also traps millions in their homes and shuts down businesses for long periods of time. Now, many blame it for what happened here. Ten people died on Thursday in an apartment fire. They say the emergency response was too slow. A fire truck appeared to get stuck behind fencing used to keep people in their buildings. And on social media, witnesses claimed some of the victims were locked in their units. Officials deny that's the case, but it's infuriated thousands to the point of protest. Well, the government actually overestimate the people's ability to endure all the pains associated with zero COVID. The strategy is also being criticized from a public health perspective. Some argue China should have purchased higher quality vaccines and that it isn't locking down for the right reasons. When you put restrictions, you do it to give you time to be able to do something productive. They, to, at least from what we were seeing, we're just rigidly closing things down, which unless you have a really, really good purpose of preparing yourself for opening, it, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. After seizing a third unprecedented term as president, these protests are an unprecedented test of Xi's authority. And the outrage is showing no sign of subsiding. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. On a resort island in Italy, the search is still on for five people missing and feared dead in the wake of a devastating landslide. Workers have already recovered seven bodies, including a three-week-old baby and a young brother and sister. These images give you some idea of the incredible force as the landslide tore down a mountainside on Saturday. It dragged cars and even buses into the ocean. Pope addressing the tragedy today. Sono vicino alla popolazione dell'isola d'Ischia. 
I'm very close to the population of Ischia, he said, during his traditional weekly blessing in St. Peter's Square. He said he was praying for victims, survivors, and rescue workers. Today, the Italian Prime Minister declared a state of emergency, providing close to $3 million in federal aid. Back here in Canada, we have the story of a breach of personal data at one of the world's best-known security companies. Carolyn Dunn now with the Edmonton man who's decided to go public about his discovery. Just over a year ago, Andrew Kopp signed on for a home security system with Brinks. He chose Brinks because it was synonymous with airtight security, the peace of mind he was looking for. Instead, when he logged on to his Brinks online portal, he got access to the information of other Brinks customers. My reaction is kind of crazy, so I went with the security system for security reasons, of course. So I really don't feel that they're safeguarding other people's information. Every click revealed new information about dozens of people. Names, addresses, cell phone numbers, payment history, even exposing details of customers' home security systems. He tried to report it to tech support and customer service. Probably 100 addresses from other Brinks home customers, which is why I'd like to speak to a manager and see what the heck is going on. No one ever called cop back. Well, I was disturbed that Brinks didn't jump on it right away when this person reported it. Personal information is so powerful. It can lead to cases of identity theft that can just wipe you out for months. Brinks acknowledged its customer service representative did not follow the proper protocols to escalate the issue, but says Brinks Home addressed the issue within 24 hours after receiving a direct email from COP. Brinks calls it an isolated issue, affecting less than 0.01% of its customer base, adding the nature of the data that was visible did not require a customer notification. Not satisfied with Brink's response, COP has contacted the federal and Alberta privacy commissioners. I paid for a security company because I wanted security and they can't safeguard my personal information. In response to COP's call to the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Alberta, that agency tells Go Public it will be contacting Brink's to remind it of its obligations to report breaches to their office as well as notify affected individuals. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Runaway cattle are wreaking havoc in rural Quebec. It's really funny, especially for city people, you know, I think that I think that's why the story got such a buzz. But for the people here, you know, it's a problem. Now a new tactic to bring them home. And an experimental new treatment for Alzheimer's. I started to forget. I just couldn't remember it at all. Inside a new drug trial that could give patients hope. Plus. There are consequences to our actions, Sabi. I am not going up for them. I sit down with Bilal Beg to talk about breaking barriers. I feel connected to a greater purpose. In the second season of their critically acclaimed CBC comedy, Sorta. We're back in two. I lived here for almost 15 years and this is the first time I've ever seen it like this. Traffic was way backed up and trying to get in here. The Thanksgiving travel crush continues tonight in the U.S. with an estimated 2.5 million people moving through airports today. That's a new high since the pandemic began. More than 2,000 flights were delayed, but the industry says things are running better than just a few months ago. Flight schedules are less ambitious and new workers have been hired. It actually feels pretty good. When we left Florida, we, we had heard the same thing, that there were going to be 150,000 passengers, and that actually the airport was easy to get in and out of, and this feels fantastic. And with many people still working remotely, experts say the window for Thanksgiving travel may now be a bit wider and could stretch into the next few days. A small town in Quebec says it has a new plan tonight to deal with an unusual problem. They're trying to round up a herd of escaped cows that have been wreaking havoc and causing damage. The cows have been on the lamb since July when they escaped from a farm near St. Barnabé. Since then, they've been spotted more than seven kilometers away near the town of saint Sever. Sarah Levitt spent the day in that community where, after several failed attempts to wrangle the herd, officials say enough is enough. 
Outside St. Sever's Catholic Church, you get a sense that this is cow country. And yet this is not a normal sight. Young cows on the lamb. They escaped in July, owner Pierre Lapointe says, after a violent thunderstorm scared them. The herd wreaked havoc on crops as they trampled to the next village over. Nearby cowboys were even hired to try to corral them. The cowboys came gathered the cows and at the last second there was a crop of uh, there was one last crop standing a corn crop with really tall uh, plants and the cows just went uh, back to the woods again the longer the cows remain outside the harder it gets to capture them they've gone back to their feral roots says the president of a local agriculture union we know where they are but that doesn't make it any easier to capture them he says it's really funny especially Especially for city people, you know, I think that I think that's why the story got such a buzz. But for the people here, you know, it's a problem that, that just can, that's not solved yet. The owner stands to lose an estimated hundred thousand dollars in livestock, not to mention the cost of the damage inflicted by the herd. Now, Quebec's agriculture ministry is involved with a plan it says will work. He says the cows need to get comfortable with human presence again before any further attempts are made. With all the attention brought on by the escape artists, officials are warning people, don't take matters into your own hands. You'll only scare the cows more, and that's the last thing authorities want. And nobody knew before this week where saint Sever was. I think now it's on the map for good. The cows could not be found for comment. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, saint Sever, Quebec. Now to a challenge facing farmers across the prairies. Rising prices and big money have forced many to sell their land or expand their operations. As Sam Sampson tells us, it's not only the family farms that are being lost, but small towns too. Farm work never stops. Even in winter. While Terry Bame clears a path to his shop, He's worried about the path forward for future farmers. This is creating a situation where farmers are really, you know, the cash cow to be milked on every teat. <laughs> Researchers say about 2% of Saskatchewan farms are controlled by non-farmers, like pension plans or investors who rent it out. And that number is climbing. They say this trend could speed up rising costs. Local farmers could be left with no choice, expand or get out of the industry. And that could mean fewer people in rural communities. It's much more difficult to provide services, uh, schools close, hospitals the usual uh, disappear. Only Canadians or private Canadian companies can buy land in Saskatchewan. The province does grant exemptions, many on the condition that owners rent out to locals. One of the largest investors in Saskatchewan land says renting offers farmers a chance to start or grow their careers without the risks of ownership. Land is our bread and butter. We have to take care of it. We farm it, not mine it. If they mine it, they're not going to be my tenant. So there's just a lot of concentration going on in agri-food trade. These Canadian farmers and academics fight for protections against agricultural monopolies. You might have to actually start thinking about putting a cap on the amount of land that anyone or any company can own. I don't think we'd want to go down that road. I think when you start doing things like that, that means that then I should be able to control everybody. When Terry Baim decides he's had enough farm work, he hopes to sell or rent to a neighboring farmer. His small act to keep his town alive. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Kalonzi, Saskatchewan. When we come back, a groundbreaking Canadian TV series that's changing the conversation. If we do this well, this can mean a lot for a lot of people. Next, my chat with Bilal Beg, co-creator, writer, and star of the critically acclaimed comedy, Sorta. Plus. Sad. It really is sad, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good memories here. Protecting PEI's coastline from the next climate disaster. So why am I on stage at Tarragon Theatre in Toronto? It's to speak with Bilal Beg, the co-creator and star of the excellent series, sort of, on CBC and HBO Max. I have fantastic questions for you, like 
What is art, Boal? Wow, Ian, that is a fantastic question. I have better questions to come, but first, Bilal's resume in 30 seconds. Why are you waiting out front? I wanted to see what you are wearing. Okay. You think this is too much? Yeah, it's a bit too jump. much. Jump. Come, under jump. Bilal Beg is the star and co-creator of the groundbreaking TV series, Sort Of. CBC describes it as the first Canadian TV show to be led by a queer South Asian Muslim. I'm gonna get something to eat or drink or stab myself with. Anyone want anything? The compelling comedy has received enthusiastic acclaim from critics. And as viewers continue to rave about the show to beg, it's clear Sort Of is connecting with audiences not just in Canada, but around the world. You're so real. Thank you for being so real. I, I, I'm glad our kids have been exposed to you. I'm, I'm glad I exposed myself to them. For someone who hasn't seen Sort Of, how would you describe it in a few sentences? Um, sort of uh, follows the life of the character that I play named Sebi and they're kind of in the middle of their 20s and moving through transition in every aspect from sure gender but also family dynamics shifting and, and work and they're like super millennial and just moving through life but also it, there's so many other wonderful characters in the show and I, I love that we kind of apply the word transition to all of them. And to what extent is Sabi autobiographical? Um, a little bit, um, but there is a lot of um, freedom and play and yeah, a little bit of autobiography, but mostly, um, you know, pretend. <laughs> it is a television show after all, it's not real life, but, but there are a lot of moments in there that feel very real. And I want to play an excerpt now of where Sabi is uh, told to, to boy up because uh, an uncle is coming to, to visit. Let, let's just play that. Mom, what's wrong? That was Shehra's on the phone. He's coming here to take the donations to the mosque. Get your brother to change his clothes. He won't listen to me. Your uncle and cousin will be here in 20 minutes. There are consequences to our actions, Sabi. I am not boying up for them. You can. You can't order young but. There's lots in, the, in that entire scene that's interesting on so many layers, but you know, at its essence, it's about this tension between Sabi, their background, and, and who they are today. And, and I mean, I assume that that is a tension in your life that, you, that you've had to deal with for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, a lot of the messaging I was receiving from the world growing up was, that we can only kind of be one thing, or if we know that we're, we have this skin color or belong to this kind of faith, that that's, you know, the box that you kind of stay in. But I've, you know, I, I think the world has been changing, continues to change, and I, I'm really excited about uh, making space for the fact that nobody actually is is one thing and we all are a bunch of different things um, together and um, yeah I think Sebi's on that journey too. The critical reception has been extraordinary. I don't I can't think of a movie or a TV show where there's such unanimity among mm. critics. They, they love it obviously and they seem to get it. Um, on a personal level in terms of viewers what kind of reaction have you been getting? You know, I've had experiences where parents have told me that they, um, you know, almost see their kind of queer trans children in, in a not different way, but just in a 
maybe it's a fuller or deeper way or something like that. You sometimes need art, like somebody who's not in your family to be able to use them as a talking point or something just to get conversations going because sometimes it's hard to talk about identity stuff and especially in family dynamics and I have heard from younger folks too that their parents have started to use their pronouns more correctly through through the show and mm -hmm. again that's like awesome. But from from what I understand you didn't have a lot of these conversations yourself growing up. Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Yeah I mean it was fairly um, uh, what a simple I think is the word we didn't grow up with a lot of money and my parents were working a lot you know we understood that our our parents were doing a lot of the heavy lifting on trying to make sure there's food and um, access to whatever resources they could get so it was a fairly quiet childhood too and a lot of like yeah non conversations it just didn't feel like there was time um, for that, I guess, you know, and yeah, I, I, that is a total difference from, I think, the kinds of conversations that Sebi and Ruffo, their, their mom, are having on the show. Yeah. Aksa was looking everywhere for you. It's only gone for like a few hours. When you are as important as you are, you can't leave people for that long. Hey, what just happened there? Your father is coming on the next flight he can find. He wants to fix you. Oh, shit. Sorry. Don't go away from me. I won't. If... If you don't go away from me. So a powerful scene, uh, and I couldn't help but wonder to what extent that reflects your relationship with your mother, if I can ask you that. Yeah, sure. Um, it doesn't. <laughs> um, I remember that scene in particular when we were able to kind of find it in the writing. I. I I was like, if this, if we do this well, this can mean a lot for a lot of people because it offers a possibility. Like, even the fact that Ruffo is sitting there in that bar, this queer and trans bar, like just that image is so striking and powerful. And if we can offer that to the world, you know, all, I think all parents, but particularly South Asian parents, maybe even more particularly Muslim parents, can kind of see the possibility that there are so many ways to love a child and I still remember filming that scene and we couldn't even look at each other because we were crying before the cameras even rolled and the director was like, I can't, you know, you can't start this scene bawling, both of you, you know. <laughs> You've spoken about how this, this show has, has affected people and maybe changed the conversations that people have had in their families and maybe just changed them. I'm curious, for you, mm -hmm. uh, going through this experience, having this program out there, doing the second season of it, how has it changed you? You know, maybe it's about, um, I, f I, be I think belonging is the word that's coming up for me. Like I was searching a lot as a kid around where to kind of go to be accepted or just settle in like somewhere, anywhere, you know? and. And I'm sure, like, for sure, that kind of followed me through college and and afterwards. And and I think um, a lot of doors have opened up and possibilities for me. And I think I think it makes me feel like I can really settle in to myself and my approach to my own work. So it's it's a cool feeling to be like. Um, this is who I am, this is who I get to be in these spaces, and there are options, and um, that, that, that's, that's the biggest kind of um, realization for me. Like, even years ago, I, I just didn't know that all of this could be possible. The program is terrific. You're terrific in it, and uh, it's been really nice to, to be able to sit down and, and speak with you. Thank you. Thanks so much. I should point out, you know, we, we played some pretty weighty scenes there. It is a comedy. It will make you laugh. 
It's obviously very clever as well, and it does have weighty scenes, but if you haven't seen it, I do recommend uh, you take a look. Season two of Sort Of is uh, now out, and you can find it on CBC Gem. Up next on The National, a new Alzheimer's drug that could change lives. This is a very hopeful time in Alzheimer's disease. Next, why there's excitement, but skepticism too, and what it means for Canadians diagnosed with the disease. Plus. We're not there, we've been away for a week over here, but I think the country is falling in love with this team. You know, win or lose. Meet the Canadian brothers who are flying the flag in Qatar. There could soon be new optimism for some of the hundreds of thousands of Canadians living with Alzheimer's disease. Two pharmaceutical companies say they have developed a breakthrough drug that slows the advance of memory loss, and they're promising to release the full results of a worldwide human trial this Tuesday. As Mike Crawley shows us, there is excitement, but also skepticism ahead of the announcement. How are you, Athelia? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. good. For the past two years, Lorraine Klein has been part of a global drug trial, with this location overseen by Dr. Sharon Cohen. Hi, Lorraine. The subjects participating were at the mild stage of Alzheimer's. Klein is 73 and works as a grocery cashier. That's where she first noticed memory trouble. You have to remember vegetable numbers. There was one number I started to forget. I just couldn't remember it at all. Tests confirmed some cognitive impairment, and a brain scan revealed clumps of a protein that's linked to Alzheimer's, called amyloid. That made Klein eligible for this drug trial. We're going to start the infusion, start the study medicine. The drug is called lecanemab. In September, its makers issued a press release about their findings, saying the drug reduced amyloid in the brain and slowed cognitive decline by 27 percent. Highly statistically significant, with, with disease slowing being seen as early as six months into treatment. What's not clear yet? How much the drug will cost or its side effects? The study's full results are to be released Tuesday at an international conference in San Francisco. This is a very hopeful time in Alzheimer's disease. Cohen will be one of the researchers presenting. We have, for the first time, an opportunity to slow down a bad disease at an early stage when people are still functioning well. As much enthusiasm as there is surrounding lecanemab's potential, there's wariness. The two companies that developed it also developed a similar drug called Aduhelm. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration gave it rapid approval last year, despite its failure to actually slow cognitive decline. The brain is the most complex entity in the universe, and arguably Alzheimer's is the most complex disease of the brain. Um, so the fact that we have failed and failed and failed, it's not surprising. All, right, All of those know. failures have Dr. Donald Weaver's team on a slightly different path. Alzheimer's disease is really an autoimmune disease, a disease of the immune system within the brain. Weaver's theory is that amyloid triggers Alzheimer's when its role as an infection fighter gets misdirected. In its search and destroy mission to try to find bacteria, cannot tell bacteria from brain cells, and so it starts to inadvertently kill brain cells. The researchers here in Weaver's lab aim to find drugs that tone down amyloid rather than blocking it as lecanemab does. Sooner or later, it's going to come. You know, we're going to get effective therapies. While all this may offer hope to people in the early stages of Alzheimer's, it's a different story for Feli Dizon. Who is that? Doors, me, Ate, Mila, Tala. She would remember quite well Something would happen a long time ago, but if I would ask what we did for lunch, she wouldn't remember now. She and Vince Penkuska have been married for 20 years. She was very friendly, nice, lovely personality. Penkuska doesn't expect any new Alzheimer's drug will help his wife. Telling to say, I don't know really what is waiting for us. I know that Feli will have more difficulty. The chance that the devastating effects of Alzheimer's could be slowed for anyone, that's what's driving hopes for the lecanemab results on Tuesday. My hopes is I get rid of the protein, that amyloid protein in my brain that's causing me to lose my memory. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Prince Edward Island is still rebuilding after Fiona hit earlier this year. This is Prince Edward Island, right? Our beautiful beaches, we gotta 
we got to keep them beautiful. Next, a sustainable way to protect Canada's coastlines from the next big disaster. Plus, celebrating the Canadian men's first ever World Cup goal in Qatar in Canadian fashion. That's in our moment. A big holiday kickoff in Toronto this weekend. The tree lighting at Nathan Phillips Square. The area outside City Hall has been transformed into a winter wonderland, complete with public skating, now open for the season. Repairs are still underway on PEI after Fiona hit earlier this fall. The island's coastlines were particularly hard hit. Cape McKenna shows us efforts to better protect those shores against future climate disasters. Banged and bruised after Fiona, this cliff is getting some first aid. Many hands make light work. This is what's called a living shoreline. The hay bales act like big seed packages, right? If those seeds take root, they'll hold on to the soil, preventing it from washing away. A local nonprofit group is managing this project to rebuild some of PEI's shorelines. Here's how it looked just over a year ago later with plant growth and now after Fiona. If this repair works, new growth will come next spring. You'll usually find that erosion uh, ends up slowing down as the natural processes of the coast start to sort of re-engage. Experts say living shorelines are often more effective than building a barrier of rock or concrete. Those seawalls can deflect the waves, damaging neighboring waterfront instead. But no option is perfect. If you're looking for a magic bullet, I don't believe that really exists. And I'm not sure that it ever could because, you know, Mother Nature is bigger than all of us. During Fiona, some coasts lost up to 10 meters of shoreline. The turbocharged erosion has islanders worried. More than 90% of the shoreline on Prince Edward Island is privately owned, putting the onus to protect it on the people who bought it. The trees were up on the land, and as you can see now, they're, they're damp. This property has been in Eva Bullman's family for generations. Fiona took a chunk out of the shoreline. It's sad. It really is sad. Yeah. yeah There's a lot of good memories here. Next spring, she says she'll be paying out of pocket to plant along the coast. I think everyone should get involved. Look after our shorelines. I mean, this is Prince Edward Island, right? Our beautiful beaches, we gotta, we gotta keep them beautiful. That's what teams are trying to do here, keeping hope alive as storms worsen and sea levels rise. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Stratford, Prince Edward Island. We want to take a moment to relive Canada's big moment today at the World Cup. Alfonso Davies scored this country's first ever goal at the men's tournament. And these three Canadian brothers had front row seats in Qatar. And as you can see, they were dressed for it too. The Rawlinson brothers and their Mountie costumes have earned them more than a few fans at the World Cup. Tonight, their trip of a lifetime and their moment today in the stands is our moment. We're super fortunate to be able to be in a position to be able to Absolutely. go and it was then about, okay, what kind of, you know, iconic costumes can we have to, to represent Canada? And then people were so friendly and outgoing and we've taken millions of pictures and high five. Yeah, our faces people. are everywhere. We were just sitting at a game at Canada playing soccer in the World Cup, uh, you know, for the men's team just sitting there and soaking it all in. We didn't have much time for the first goal. Just because it was like so, it happened so quick. We were right there, right? And uh, it happened to be right in front of us. Which it, it we was, couldn't have planned better. Stephen Buchanan coming down the wing and it, it, it just opened up. And then a perfect cross yeah. and a world-class finish. It was just, you couldn't ask for a better first goal. We grabbed each other and, and it yeah, was just a lot of other Canadian great. fans grabbing each other. We're just high-fiving and hugging each other, hugging strangers, and, and it was fantastic. But I think the country is falling in love with this team, you know, win or lose. And seeing that goal, and we were following the social media and the international journalists that are the following people. That was a Canadian moment. The first time in 36 years, scored by number 19, Fonji Davies. That, that was the best 20 minutes of our life there. At the end of the day, it's a goal, right? It, it's, it doesn't change the world, but it changes our world.
In case you're wondering, why aren't we showing you the goal? Well, the World Cup's kind of like the Olympics. If you don't have the official rights to it, as another TV network does, then you have to show fans reacting, including three brothers dressed up as Mounties in Doha. You still get the sense of how exciting that moment was for so many people. It is a national for November 27th. Have a good night.